It's a high-tech conversation. And a low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. This week, we have Hugh Crompton here to talk about the world of Boxwood. Without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Jim Hendricks and Hugh Crompton. Hugh Crompton. So, uh, Jim? No, I've got it. I've got it. I've gone one step ahead of you, mate. I, I worked out that you'd muted me, so I, um, I made sure I unmuted it. I would like to point out that uh, I, I am supposedly known as the Boxwood Boxwood King, a Boxwood Bob, they call me in one of the uh, one of the um, news groups, and um, it's it's because of my fascination for Boxwood, and um, I would probably say it as as an addiction for Boxwood, and the the thing about that is that um, I end up uh, being an addict, and every addict needs a dealer, and it, and it so happened that I found my dealer on eBay, and his name was Hugh Compton, and Hugh um, is the aficionado in the UK on English Boxwood. I call it English Boxwood, nice, nice way of putting it. Um, and it's been my pleasure tonight to be asked to uh, introduce you to uh, the king of the king of woods, uh, Hugh Crompton. So I'll be asking some questions to Hugh tonight. Um, and we've, we've kind of rehearsed a bit, but I don't think it's gonna work very well. I can't even see the, um, the way Trenick's gonna put it up, but we're gonna be working against some slides. So I'll kick off with asking one of the first questions of, of the few that I have here. And hopefully these questions will generate questions from the audience amongst us in the second half of tonight's bench talk um, and or, or new questions uh, that we may not have, have thought about. So let's just start with something very, very simple. How, how come you, uh, are you, have you been involved with Boxwood? Boxwood? Tell, us, tell us your story. Um, Trini, can I have the first slide, please? <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a landscape architect and an ecologist, and I've studied in America and other places and stuff. And, um, in the 90s, I found myself working for three years in um, Madagascar, and uh, I was working on the West Coast, and that's me wearing the box hat uh, on a baobab tree uh, on the West Coast, uh, Madagascar, in an endangered forest. And... Um, I uh, was working for the, uh, these trees, which are critically endangered. Um, uh, and uh, whilst I was an aid worker, I, um, I, I made lots of friends. And um, I made friends with some guys who were working in Tanzania and Mozambique, which is not very far from Madagascar. Um, and they were working on the sustainable um, production of African blackwood. Um, and I got into that in, in the late 90s. So. Um, I, I worked for 10 years to, to make African blackwood sustainably harvested in uh, Miombo woodland on the coast of Tanzania. Um, and um, I, I, that was mainly um, directed at uh, classical music's use of um, African blackwood. Um, and I found I had some transferable skills um, because before African blackwood was used for music, um, box was used for um, uh, classical music. So same instruments and same technology and I, I got uh, stopped thinking globally and traveling around the world and I, I started thinking locally um, and uh, found that there were some box forests um, near my house and I didn't have to go around the world um, to, um, to, to practice what I preach. Is that, is that um, a comprehensive enough answer there Jim? You're muted Jim. I'm, I'm frantically sending messages to Shrenik to say, can you unmute me? I can't unmute myself. Uh, yeah, that's magic. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you, you noticed because it, I didn't first notice that on that tree, but that's a human being on the side of that tree. Uh, and you can see him doing um, gorilla impersonations uh, from his shadow. It's, it's a good worth, one, Shrenik. Yeah, that's, it's that's, worth mentioning that. And you can tell what. Uh, Jim, no, no part of the baobab tree is, is useful for its timber. Uh, it's useful for many things, no. but but it's it's just like squashed sponge as a as a tree. It's a succulent, and so I started in the wrong place for timber, um, but I was in the right place geographically, and and uh, my my career led me to trees that did produce decent timber, um, and uh, but that's yeah, where you I moved on to. 
uh, moved on to African Blackwood and uh, and then on to back to the UK and and um, uh, and Boxwood and, and and that leads me on to my my next question. If you could just put the next slide up there, Shrinik. Um The um, how, how how do you see the uh, future of uh, Boxwood as a sustainable fine wood? Um, we seem to have two two images certainly on my screen anyway. Um, there we go. How do you see the future of uh, boxwood as a sustainable fine wood, and uh, what threats do you see? I, and, and this image here um, is is of your plantation, I believe. Yeah, um, I've been replanting for about eleven years. I've been replanting um, large areas of uh, chalk downland and limestone escarpment with a new box forest, and this is a, a new a new boxwoodland um, where I've planted about um, twelve hectares. Um, at about you know ten thousand plants a hectare. What's that in acres? Um, it's a lot of acres. Uh, you know, um, forty acres or, or so um, of steep hills. Um, and um, uh, everything was going quite well for me until about two thousand and sixteen or two thousand and seventeen, when um, the the dreaded moth arrived from um, China um, and um, uh, presented a big threat in Europe and um, began to be a big threat in. It had, it had been around for a bit longer than that, but we didn't know how serious it was going to be. Um, and Jim, if, can you zoom in on that slide um, on the, the the small tree in the plantation, the beech? Um, Just at the bottom of the uh, yeah, stem yeah. there, uh, Shrenik, uh, the tree in the foreground, the, the large tree in the foreground, you'll see a um, little hanging. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's actually a moth trap. Um, and, I, and last year I caught a couple of moths in there. So... Even in my own plantations, I have moths, so I'm preparing for the worst. And um, in France and Germany, um, uh, the various people have been un unable to prevent um, uh, almost total loss of their best woodlands. I mean, there are still trees surviving, but um, the trees have been effectively been wiped out by a, a caterpillar from, from a remote area of China that uh, against which we have no uh, good is a good answer in the wild um but in britain um the trees are a lot more spread out uh and they're protected a little bit by remoteness um even in france and germany isolated populations have survived okay so it's not totally gloomy and the actually the owners of um this woodland here are americans um the getty family and um, they are totally committed to um, uh, safeguarding their asset there um, and making sure that this is an arc population that um, that carries on growing. Um, even if we do get a little bit of caterpillars, we they're easy enough plants, small enough to spray there. But some of the older woodlands we are prepared to lose, uh, yeah. so because we are not able to spray <laughs> properly, properly. So, in answer to your question, Jim, the 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 future is far from rosy, I'm afraid. At the bottom of that woodland, on the next slide, Shrenik, you'll see some of the larger trees. And I wonder if we move to that slide. Yeah, the, this is actually on the same hillside, but just a bit further down slope. And these trees have yeah. grown very, they've grown really well um, in ideal conditions. Um, they're only about 130 years old. They're, they're, not, they're not that old. Um, they've got relatively open grain and they've grown like bean poles. And that's very good for, for those people who are selectively <laughs> felling them. Um, like me, um, but um, it also told me that that was the ideal location to plant some more. Um, and um, this is one of the populations where we may have to do a bit of um, extra felling here if the caterpillars get in, um, in a way that we can't control them. We, we will take these trees out and um, uh, store, their, store their timber. So, And there's a fine line between you, you, you um, wait it, you mustn't wait to take them out because if you leave it too long, you're, you're going to start rot. The well, I mean, there are lots of Jim. There are cautionary tales from Germany and France where the authorities have not been able to save the standing timber, and that's that's something that I'm trying to act ahead. Um, it, it's most um, of the box on this estate. Um, I've got a bit of control over because there's no statutory protection. So I think this is a good test case here, and I've also got a very willing owner um, who's who's very very. I've been working for for eleven years now, so. Um, yeah, that, it, it can't be done in the summer. Just just to let you know, box can't be felled in the summer because it's such a pale, pale wood, um, which stains very easily if it's got sugary sap in it. And you have to wait till the winter 
um, lots of trees like that, you know, I don't know, um, some of the maples and, you know, you'll know all the pale wood trees, you can't fell them in the summer and the, the, the sugar just fills with bacteria. So you've, you're and only- we, we, had, we had a long conversation about the, 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 the ecology and the sustainability and that's something we, we can talk at depth in, in the questions and answers. And uh, I know that uh, a lot of people are interested in in, in this wood as a sustainable uh, treasure of Great Britain and, and uh, many other countries. So um, if we move on, on to, to actually moving on to the customers, because that's an important aspect of, um, of your uh, use of the wood and the, uh, the wood that you felt. So Shani, if you could just move on to the next um, beautiful uh, tool. There's, there's some boxwood in this um, uh, instrument, which is uh, musical instruments. And if you start with the musical instruments, um, uh, uh, I put a few slides up there for you, Hugh, to explain why, uh, we, where your principal businesses and customers are. Yeah, my main customers are musical instrument manufacturers. Um, the, it's the biggest market. Um, it, the, they deal in bulk um, and um, it's all the major musical instrument families. Um, uh, Chris Coe's pipes here, um, Irish pipes, Um, all, everywhere where there's pipes, you know, Aita, Gallagher, uh, Bombards all around the Mediterranean. Um, people play Irish pipes all around the world as well. Um, so, but it's all the musical instrument families are clarinets, oboes, flutes, um, uh, recorders uh, at, of, of many different sizes. Um, and also lots of different tunings. You find, you know, the oboe makers, um, a professional oboist has many different oboes with different, different pitches and uh, there's lots of different size clarinets um, and they buy, they effectively, they're my biggest market because they buy green timber. So they buy timber, which has only come, uh, been a year off the tree. Um, and um, they, they, there's a lot to be learned from musical instruments because they work it quite a lot when it's green uh, in order to, to dry it out and stabilize it in, in as close a form as they can um, to the, in a very similar dimensions to to how they're finished um so um have we got some more slides of other other yeah there's here? another there's another slide uh there's another slide of the detail of uh one of the characteristics which yeah, are, the, uh, which um are, yeah. turners are also a big a big customer of mine um people love to turn box on the round um thread chasers there are lots of thread chasers uh, around the world making ring boxes i mean you can see with this music instrument is you if you can if you can make music instrument you can make some threaded lid boxes um but tool makers are, are um probably the second second biggest i think that's the next slide we've got uh, yeah yeah this uh this giant oh, this train. Is... um i love the lower the low quarter deck on on that um but um uh, Toolmakers are usually buying dry box or box to dry and then working um, the, the, the box into this, like, these lovely extravagant forms, um, make, making um, uh, beautiful um, uh, machines. And, and I think, um, uh, sorry to preempt another question, Jim, but that's extremely big for box. You don't usually get box that big. Um, it, it's, it's a good idea to think small uh, with box and small is, is beautiful because most of the, the tools made of box are small. Um, and that's definitely at, at the, um, the upper limit. Uh, of the, I think I had to get, I had to coerce my dealer into, this is the high end of the, the drug market. Is the <laughs> high end of the uh, dealership. <laughs> um, I don't know the next slide on there, Shrenik, that uh, uh, um, may, may give you a, a, a slightly smaller example. I think it's again, yeah. one of mine, but it's uh, down. But this one's a very difficult one, and I picked this one out um, because it, it it was part of that log that you sent me, which we'll see later on. And um, it just goes to show how you can uh, um, create um, very very strong uh, handles and things like um, you know that, that require a lot of strength. Uh, ultimately, this is a piece that uh, you sent me and said try and do what you can out of that with a bit of a giggle in the background. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the pistol grip, isn't it? Um, yeah. Usually, usually when people ask me for saw handles, they need great big sheets that are an inch and a quarter thick and like eight inches by six inches, and it's very hard to 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 cut those from dry box. If you cut them out of wet box, quite likely to warp, 
Um, so it's it, saw handles are not an easy thing to make. Um, and and I always appreciate a guy like you, Jim, because you will look for knots in it and um, work around a knot, and not everybody does that. So you know, if you're asking, well, there, or you can look at the you can look at the grain pattern, and when you've got a knotted area, uh, and I'd like to point out some of the characteristics actually here is that the the uh, the knotted areas act as reinforcement bars. I always call box with the metal. Uh, almost like concrete and malleable and, and it's hard but it's soft to use and it's just so perfect in that way but those those knots are effectively reinforcement bars across where it would normally check and that's what I look for uh, in boxwood one of the only woods I look for knots really cool uh, cool um, uh, okay so move just moving on uh, we're, we're sh short of time um we're, we're, we're sorry, probably Jim hold on I think you had something can we have another slide? Oh, there might be another slide yeah. to talk about. Ah. Yeah, so we're talking about shipping. Uh, and uh, I picked this picture because I know this is the UK and one of the one of the reprobates that I know, um, stealing all the box, <laughs> stealing all the box would have, I, I wanted to buy. Um, but uh, this is the UK, but obviously you, you, you ship anywhere in the world, is that correct? That's right. I mean, um, the, it, we are spoiled in Britain because um, this is um, Matthew Platt and I, and this is his vehicle. And I tell you, my vehicle had more stuff in it. And I basically um, I got about um, three quarters of a ton for musical instruments. And Matthew selected his for tool making. Um, and um, we, we split the harvest of uh, some felling between us because we wanted slightly different things. Um, but um, we both live... Um, within 50 miles of this felling location. So it was terribly easy for us to, to nip out and get these trees. Um, not everybody can do that. Um, once you leave um, Europe, um, you're not allowed to export with bark on and you have also got high FedEx or UPS costs. So um, it, it, it becomes a billeted, a billeted market where um, the timber needs processing to take the waste off it um, and, um, and, and Giving, giving people blanks that, that are close to their finished, uh, desired finished size. So um, uh, I think some of I, the next shots, we've got some of the examples of the billets. So Shrenik uh, uh, just moves through those for you. You can, you can talk your way yeah, through. through um, we just, the, the back of the, um, the truck of Matthews just now um, had wet timber. This is dry timber. And I, I often go to an estate where we fell trees and they say, oh, we've got a couple in a barn that, do you want those as well? And it's like, yeah, too right. <laughs> of course I want those as well. And they, they produce a couple of beauties like these, um, which are good straight trees. And as a size guide, they don't usually come much bigger than this. And um, if, because I'm quartering and um, uh, the, the shake, that big shake doesn't matter, I always have to be a bit aware of hairline cracks and, and uh, other, other little, little problems. But if the tree is too fat, it's often rotten in the middle, same as a, an oak or a yew, or you know, a lot of big trees are rotten in the middle. Um, and a tree like, like you're looking at there is about 170 years old. Um, and at six inches, um, in, in, it's just in the back of my car here. And I, you know, I was very pleased to buy these. Um, got my children's <laughs> spades in there as well. Um, and I think I billeted those up. You can you can see how I'd billet those up. I cut them at the elbows, um, uh, cross cut them, and, and then I quarter them. And I think those all went to be um, low pitch Irish uh, whistles um, with Jonathan Swain, who is based in Somerset, the regular <laughs> customer of mine. So um, uh, the next, I think the next shot shows us um, what what happens when you. Um... If you'd just like to move on onto that one, Shrenik, for it. Oh, these are, this is an uh, oboe set. Um, yeah, when, when you're billeting them. And, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, the, you, you have to quarter box absolutely on the quarter. It's a test of your quartering skills because if you don't quarter it, it will quarter itself, especially when it's, um, you know, wet, uh, within a year of being wet. So... This is a book matched um, uh, oboe set with two, um, the two, the mid joint and the top joint underneath, and then the bell joint on the top. So um, this is very highly prized for um, an oboe maker because the the DNA of the um, the dendrochronology of the, of the ring pattern 
will be the same in all three joints um, and it will give a, a more um, uh, re uh, resonant uh, character sound. Uh, you know, all the three billets will sing together um, and um, you won't get any um, clash of uh, slightly different um, character of, of, of um, sound being produced by it. So um, I've just I've tried to select to select the next uh, four slides, uh, Shrenik. Um, to uh, ask you this question about, which I'm sure absolutely everybody in the audience would be asking if they were at all interested in um, boxwood, is um, what are the rough prices of boxwood and, and what grades? Oh, and, um, um, this set, so uh, the, la the set that you just looked at before is 80 pounds. That's 80 pounds or it's all by volume. So if a maker asks me for slightly bigger sizes, and, and usually the hand hand makers um, hand the those working by hand they like it slightly bigger. Those working with CNC they like very tight sizes, and they're usually producing student instruments, and they're, they're not they're not top grade. And the, the the better makers will ask for slightly bigger billets. So a price. So on the next slide, on the next slide, you'll see you're you're actually quartering it on the on the bandsaw, and I think on the on the one after that, Shrenik. Yeah, this uh, this is for clarinets um, to clarinet. go to Boston, uh, yep. and the, the these are cut very precisely to the dimensions that the um, the buyer the, the the maker has told me. So he's got no waste on um, transport, and these are straight ready to put on the lathe, um, and um, and usually they'll rough turn them with the flats showing straight away, and they'll rifle bore them with a, a narrow bore. And then the, the wood dries and stabilizes very, very quickly once it's a tube. And that's, 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 it, that, that's one sense. customer, but, you're, but the important thing to note here is that you, you actually, as with me, these are not what I asked for. I asked for quarter sawn on the, on the horizontal there. And you, you, you say to me, right, fine, I'll look out for it. And you keep your eye out for it. And that's an important part is that when somebody asks you to buy boxwood from you, that the, you ask them what they want it for and uh, many a person that I've referred you to um, come back to me and said I said to him exactly what I wanted it for and he he went away and found the exact same thing that I wanted and I think that's an in, important aspect of, of yeah this. Uh, Jim in answer to that question uh, I've got 200 customers but you know virtually every one of them wants something slightly different um, yeah there's, there's hardly two alike uh, so uh, there's quite a good market for the middleman having a bit of specialist knowledge because uh, I'm able to be very helpful to, to customers, especially if it's their first time or, or um, they don't quite know exactly what they're doing. Um, I can tell them what I've supplied other people who have, you know, lifetime experience. Um, uh, so, yeah. And I think okay. the next slide, the next slide shows the extremes to which that, that, that goes to. I'm hoping that's the right slide, yeah. This is to one you sent me because I said to you, can you send me all the crazy stuff? And, yeah, uh, well, a, a tool maker should be able to use a slightly cheaper grade of wood. If you've, if you've just seen what the instrument makers need, they have to have absolutely ramrod straight grain and super, super straight quarters. And, and it should be that tool makers can, can manage with um, timber that's not absolutely A grade uh, in a historically, a, a, a lot of um, tools were made with knots and, and bendy grain wood, um, but it's just as strong and performs just as well as um, as the wood that's that could be as good as farmed maple, you know. And uh, 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 how much was this piece, Jim? Is it well, I, I think if Shrenik, if Shrenik shows you the next slide, you'll see how crazy I am. Um, I call it the elephant man. Um, I've actually got quite a lot of really beautiful stuff out of this because this is like, uh, and I, I think, you know, you, you send this to me as a, a, a bit of a, a joke between the two of us and find out, I'd love to see what you can find in there. It's like opening a Christmas present. And uh, I've still, I'm still got bits of it lying around the, surgically lying around the uh, workshop, but uh, I've used it for quite a few things. And the key to this is that all of that, uh, all of that um, con convoluted grain is immensely strong if you use it in the right, if you can read the wood and use it correctly. But one of these, I think you're you're talking about 60 quid, 70 quid, something like that for- Yeah, it was, was 10, it, 10, kilo 10 kilograms. Yeah, it's a, it's a fraction of the price of instrument grade wood. So, you know, it should be that um, tools can, can be made of um, not B grade wood, but 
wood that I would not sell to um, musical instrument manufacturers. Yeah, this is A grade to me. And if you sent me anything musical instrument, plain, straight, grain, that's, you know, C grade for me. Right, yeah, it yeah, has, yeah. It has no, it has no fundamental interest in, 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 in it for me. So, but, but I mean, it's still box. I mean, I'd make rules out of it and, uh, you know, things like the dividers and everything were made with straight grain for obvious reasons for, for uh, making sure they, they don't bend. Um, but, it, but the important thing here is that you've got everything from uh, the cheaper logs that you can't necessarily use for the music industry uh, um, and uh, everything up to the finest AAA music uh, grades and, and they're according to price. And one of the key points here that um, is important to note is when you get billeted wood, if you're overseas, you will always have to. Um, but when you get the billeted wood, effectively, you were thrown away most of the weight or given away most of the waste um, and you're, you're just getting the cream. And if you were to buy it like this, you, you get a very small percentage of the wood out, out of it that's, uh, that's usual. Cool. Um, cool. So I, I've, got a, I've got a long series of slides now of um, uh, nearly uh, one, two, four, seven slides, Srenik, um, which are the properties of wood. And this is um, where we can share this uh, question, I think, with you, because um, this is one of mine, and I think one of the key properties is, is the beauty of the wood and uh, contrasting beauty, because it's one of our finest, well, it is the finest of our hardwoods, and in contrast with, with ebony there, and I think you saw that on the, on the Irish pipes and, and various other instruments. So every one of the, of the craftspeople that use boxwood can use it as a strong, reliable, easy, easy to uh, cut uh, hardwood. And simply because it is hard and it's very difficult and you need very sharp tools, but it can be crisp like that. And if you move on to the next slide, Jenny, you can get down to quite really small sizes. Um, I know there's quite a few people built, made uh, their very first plane a little billy like this. And if you remember, Hugh, um, everybody was buying billy billets um, <laughs> with tiny little offcuts, and and it was it was wonderful for them to. Uh, to get a small piece of boxwood and make a, a Bill Carter um, Billy plane. But you can't really do that with many, many woods. Bill can, but there are, you know, if you're starting out, you need something that's crisp and, and can go to very tiny sizes there. And, and I think on the next slide, um, these are ones, uh, Hugh, we talked about, uh, how intricate can, can you go? Hugh, this is, uh, this is an amazing property of boxwood, isn't it? Yeah, um, I think the what Jim you didn't mention um, English boxwood as opposed to um, Mediterranean boxwood or, or Turkish boxwood. It's got a little yeah. bit more butter between the grain, uh, so it it doesn't suffer from tear out uh, quite as much as um, incredibly dense grain. Um, and um, carving uh, and um, this this sort of carving, I mean these uh, Catholic icons are um, the the there are collections of these which. Uh, very big in the the times of um, uh, um, what called Nation, um, when people go on pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. Um, I think it's his fifteen hundreds, the fifteen hundreds. Yeah. This carving. Um, yeah. And and um, uh, religious icons in a uh, carved in boxwood. Uh, um, I mean, this this kind of um, spreads out into Netsuki uh, and another another. It's so robust and it's basically like ivory. Um, that you can, it takes an enormous amount of detail um, and, it, and it finishes re relatively easily um, and doesn't break. Um, so, you know, I it's, think on it, the next slides, you can see some of the detail that um, you can actually achieve. And it's uh, uh, this was, sorry, when I slipped in here, when we we're talking about, you were talking about the butter between the thing, I can actually just hand cut um, castellations like this to, to, to put them into a hinge. It's that easy to do. And you're not gonna get, you can see any, no tear out at all. And so the detail you can get in that is, is quite, it's quite amazing. But yeah, on the, and, I think it's, go on. Jim, for those working on a lathe, um, the, the, it, it, if you've got good chisels and, and you've, you're good at working, you've got hardly any sanding. And, and then everybody who turns, it's like sanding is the, is the, the, the worst job ever, isn't it? Messy, yeah. and it, sometimes it takes forever to do a bowl. Um, but um, it, if, you, if you get your finish right, on musical instruments, you, you barely need any sanding at all. 
Um, so it and it takes the finish absolutely beautifully and the patina um, a year or two or 10 years old is absolutely gorgeous. And you get some flaming as well. I mean, not quite as much as some maples on fiddle fiddle sides, but um, you, the, there's plenty of med medullary and, and nice flaming that comes up with them, um, uh, with the various treatments and a bit of aging. So yeah, that's an. Who, who would be who would be crazy enough to to saw through a knot like that and expect it to stay where it was? It's amazing. And this last one I put in there, uh, a bit of a surprise for you, Hugh, because this was a, a bun that I did on an infill plate made a box with you can see the beautiful um, uh, right, uh, rings gorgeous but um, th this is this is a uh, the ability to be able to polish it to uh, a mirror finish and that there is absolutely no other finish than the wood on this this is polished using micro mesh up to 12,000 mesh and that is the wood not any varnish or any shellac or anything so it's quite amazing. And I think the next slide shows quite amazing how amazing it is. I, I showed you this you the other day. And it, when I first saw this, I thought, bloody hell, I do miss the Caribbean. And, um, I, and it fooled me. It fooled me. Even the antennae at the front are boxwood. This whole thing is boxwood. And it's carved by a Japanese gentleman. It's contemporary. Uh, but it just goes to show how it is the king of woods. And it is very much. Uh, an amazing wood that no other woods can 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 come close to, I think. Um, had you seen this before, Hugh? No, I've never seen a lobster. Uh, that's fantastic. It, it, it is, and a friend of mine carves um, uh, uh, Jurassic uh, bone creatures like a uh, saber-toothed tiger out of out of boxwood, and, and they look like skull. And I think I've seen a skull made out of one. It just looks like a human skull, and it patinates to the colour that you want it to. You could stain it quite easily to the colour that you wanted to. Um, it's quite amazing. Um, on the next slide, uh, ah, we'll move on. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. I just wanted to move on to to uh, uh, are you protecting boxwood in any way? And and uh, briefly, um, just uh, dis discuss exactly uh, how you farm it. And I think you mentioned on that earlier, but this is uh, this looks like you're stealing one out of somebody's garden. Well, uh, some friends rang me up and um, they own a restaurant um, near Chinna in the in the Chilterns and they said they were just about to refurbish the a house that was in the grounds of the restaurant and they were going to destroy these trees. Um, so me and um, Matthew Platt went and um, um, actually Matthew bought this tree to make um, mallets out of it. We're incredibly knotty um, and... Uh, I, the, elsewhere in the gardens of the restaurant, there were some very tall box, um, and I got the this, the bean poles for musical instruments, and Matthew got the big the big stuff um, for for um, the tools. So um, we had. I can see the ancillary. They're, they're, the, they're all the rebars there. They're all the reinforcement bars. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. He he got a really lovely tree there. Um, so. Um, I think yeah, there's but, another slide on 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 this one as well. Um, um, the, the, this is not far from the same location, but it's actually in a in a in a box woodland. Um, uh, it's, it's fairly close to Chinna, this one uh, near the M40, and um, this is selective management uh, where you go into a woodland and you can see I'm not cutting down any of those trees in the background because they're really bendy and small, and I just want a, a good clean stem um, like the, the 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 guy with the chainsaws cutting for me. Um, and I'm going to quarter that, um, and hopefully it's not boxes prone to staining. Um, um, uh, Simon Troops here today, he's helped me do stuff like this. Um, uh, a good clean stem, and I think that day I got, um, you know, 600 kilos of, of these um, ramrods. Um, these are heavy things as well. I mean, that log will sink in water when it before it's dried. Its specific density is 1.1, so. Um, it's very, very dense wood, and uh, I've got a car which uh, I, I love to load up and, and put over half a ton in it. And it, it doesn't look like half, yeah, doesn't it doesn't look like, I think that's about 600 kilos. Um, and, and it doesn't look like that. And um, it, it, that's um, grade A. It doesn't need to be big. You see, for me, it doesn't need to be big. It just needs to be good and straight and clean. Um, and I'm always looking at the quarter. Um, so, 
um, uh, Jim, you have this term, the north, the north facing side. Um, Box often has an asymmetric um, center. So I will always be, um, uh, 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 you always quarter it and you might get two very thin quarters that come off it and then a nice big fat one and one that's, um, uh, but you see, it, if you think back to my instrument sets, you need one for the bell and then you need the mid joints. So it's possible to book match um, the instrument sets from um, even from one log. But in practice, you make for a maker, you do 10 sets or 20 sets and you can book match from any of them because you have to allow for failure of any one of the joints during manufacture. So he wants to be able to substitute extremely similar stock from felled on the same day. So um, I've learned that. I mean, Everything I've learned, Jim, it's been from, from people who use the timber. So, um, and on your on the sustainability side of it, if the next and this is the final slide, actually, Hugh, you'll be pleased to know, it, it just made me giggle about the the sustainability with regards to the forest and the woods and the trees, but also the sustainability through the generation. And here we see a picture that you sent me, a fabulous picture of your son, and I, and it's Jenga. Uh, is the right, I call it Wenger, and I, I think that's another wood. But um, the uh, the amazing thing is that small. These are tiny little billets that you have for for sale. What are these for? Uh, they're six inch play, uh, the six inch um, pen blanks, um, and um, I, I they're the smallest product that I do, and I do them in sets. Um, and um, people turn pens out of them and small stuff like that um, all all around the world. Um, and I dry the dries pretty quickly at that size. You know, they're only um, uh, three quarters of an inch um, square. Um, so um, my son there on the left, um, I was at Box Hill on Saturday, um, which is fairly close to me and it's a pretty big box reserve. And I was talking to some dog walkers um, about box, not in any, um, uh, any terms like I am today. Um, and, and my son piped up and started talking about box with great authority um, because he, he thought that if dad was like Britain's number one of box woodland, it, there's no reason why he shouldn't be Britain's number two. So um, he just assumed uh, this, this, this same enthusiasm as, uh, as, as me. Um, so um, uh, it's nice to pass it on. And uh, my kids love um, mucking about with the, the, the timber. Um, and that's that's absolutely my point it's it's sustaining through the generations and, and thank you so much for, for running through those slides with me and 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 i think we did quite well on the basis that neither of us knew what the hell was going to come up on the screen because i can't see it and you can't see it but just to um give us a final uh, uh answer to a question the last question is before we pass it over to the audience and i'm sure that we have many um your favorite objects and I, I, I wanted to make sure that we'd got not slides, but you waving them about. And you've got a few, plus a question at the end for the audience. And I'll pass it over to you. Sure. I was just going to start with, um, my son will call this um, a telescope because uh, it's, a, <laughs> it, it's a cone, and, um, it, which is the rough for um, an oboe bell. Um, and this is how... Um, a, a musical instrument maker will make this when it's wet um, within a year or two of felling and he'll dry it to very close to this finished the finished size for this joint for the um, instrument and um, it, it will get all its um, uh, it will resolve all of its problems in that form before it's finally turned into this and another rule of thumb that the instrument makers use is you don't take more than three mil off any sitting so you never ever dig it, dig deeply into it. It's three mil only and relax. Um, so that's what I've learned from them. They're all the same like that. Um, so um, this is um, a Baroque Obo, which is, you saw the components for, for, for making this. It looks like quite a simple instrument. Um, the retail on one of these is about 3000 um, pounds, handmade um, for professionals to use in orchestras. Um, so I like best of all when makers that I supply timber um, send me stuff back. Um, and I really, really enjoy, um, um, we all know um, Philly Plains in Dorset, um, not very far from me. He made me this out of my own timber and um, I really like that. This one's a bit more exotic. Um, this is from, um, 
is it Jeff Hamilton in Kansas? Yeah. Um, he, he, and if you look carefully, he's used actually quite badly stained wood or wood with a lot of character. Um, but he's kind of matched up the, the stain. So, um, and it's incredibly hard. I mean, we're on the screens here, but this, this, it feels like um, uh, a metal or very, very strong plastic. Um, we all know what these are. I mean, I was trying, we were trying to describe earlier the slightly dodgy wood that you use for um, a London pattern chisel. And the knots in here are, are a bonus. And when people buy a set of eight of these from me, um, they always insist on them being as clean as maple. And it's like, why do you want them as clean as maple? Why don't you want them with, with things, you know, bendy bits in them and stuff? And, Rebar. Uh, yeah, Rebar. so if you ever put a ferrule on the end and you whack them, it's, it's stronger. So, um, yeah, we mentioned about turning. Um, Chester, Chester Spears done a few of these. Um, there's a guy in Orkney who actually turns these green. These, these are turned uh, in, in wet wood. Um, and he manages to control the drying, so he still makes um, uh, a beautiful little um, uh, box. Um, so, um, I think what everybody loves in box, though, is if, if you listen to this, you hear the sound, it doesn't sound like wood at all. Um, and it, this beautiful threading that you can get, and then um, this is actually a dentist's, uh, um, uh, what's the chemical that you put on your teeth historically? Uh, that there would have been a glass vial in here and then you used oh, no. it. Um, yeah, the, whatever it was that it was a me medicine for teeth, historically. Clove oil. Uh, yeah, or oil of clove. And it's so beautifully machined. And this is actually just a functional box for a glass container from about 1830. Um, and, but one of my favorites is this one. Um, which uh, this is this is fun. Everyone knows what this is. This is a Victorian beer tap um, to, to stick into a, a cask um, and with some force. And it and what it's um, 180 years old. And uh, it still works. It, it still seals perfectly. What I like about this one is the barmaids that have been using the barrels to put the tap in. They've been hitting the, uh, the, the, the stem of this with their hammers and really giving it some serious grief, but not breaking it. Um, so it's, it's turned quite similar to a musical instrument, but for very utilitarian, um, utilitarian use. So um, another, another threaded lid box. Um, Lots of guys buy these off me for um, ring boxes for weddings and I'll buy a whole suite of them. You know, the, the, the groomsmen get them and the maids of honor get them. Uh, um, this one's actually a doctor's medicine measuring glass. Um, and it's to go in a doctor's um, satchel to go and visit patients in their houses. And that's to stop the glass breaking. You put it in a, a box. So, um, um, my trinkets just um i was half expecting chris coat to come tonight because this is an 18 inch chanter blank for um uh, irish pipes so when you're going like this and you're playing and you're singing at the same time maybe you've got both your hands on on this tube um and that's what um an irish pipe maker will use to um uh as the biggest part of his instrument and the lots of other parts of the instrument, which are a bit smaller, um, the drones. Um, so those are some of my favorite objects. And what I love most is, um, is when I'm, I supply people and, and they, they, they give me something back. And that's what happened here with this, this object. Um, this is a bit of a brain teaser because uh, uh, see if anybody can guess what, what this one is. Um, it's uh, six inches tall. Um, the lid comes off. Um, this is made out of spalted box. Um, and it's actually from the um, 16th century. So it's from about 1540. So I, I think the, the, the halcyon days for box was, was about the um, Reformation and um, Tudor time. So that's a clue. See that there's a little bit of a brain teaser. See if anybody can guess what this is. 
Um, huge thanks to you. Huge thanks to you, Hugh. And I, I know we've got um, quite a few people waiting to, to ask some questions. So I'll pass you uh, and me back to Shrenik to uh, to act as MC for the um, for the questions. Thanks again, mate. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, I'm going to move over to the questions now. And uh, if and I think we've got quite a few new people tonight. So those of you who haven't joined before, if you pop your name in the chat, you'll be asked to uh, offer your your um, your question up to Hugh directly yourself. So if I allow people to unmute, uh, yep, yeah, so you are allowed to unmute yourself. And the first person tonight will be Paul. Paul? How are you, Paul? I'm fine, thanks. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Thank you, the pleasure. Yeah, it was, it was super. Now, uh, you mentioned the box caterpillar. Yes. What about box blight? Um, box blight is it mainly affects um, boxing cultivation and boxing captivity, uh, and it's spread along hedges and uh, topiary. Um, and box in the wild doesn't usually get badly affected by blight because it's in airy locations, and um, it does get it a little bit, but it doesn't spread. Um, it lives in dead leaves, uh, and um, box blight spreads when it's the the air is dead and doesn't move about so yeah because, um, it, because it's all all close to compacted uh, there's no uh, it, it's a bit like a rose if you if you don't open the center yeah you get more problems yeah. with it it's exactly yeah. the same with the hedge yeah so it's, it's a problem with hedges and i'm usually concerned with box trees in the wild rather than uh, the hedges so usually the, the, the moth uh, it, it, it eats leaves regardless of the shape of the tree, but uh, blight is mainly for hedges, yeah, is the answer. Yeah, I wondered also whether the actual historic, very large boxed hedges, whether you ever actually get cold in when they've been affected by caterpillar and things to actually harvest them. Uh, yeah, they don't usually provide timber, which is as good as wild trees. But um, yeah, we have cut those down and um, uh, I have uh, got one or two trees that, that have suffered that way. But um, they're, they're not usually the, the source for the best timber, even when they're healthy. So they're, they're more likely um, just just to, to um, be lost. So is the answer. Right. I didn't know if it'd be really gnarly for mallets. Uh, yeah, no. If they're bit, if they've if they've got a good fat trunk on them uh, and they're a decent size, yeah. The the, but I mean Matthew Pat will be selling mallets that he's he's bought um, with me. So, um, so the, the, there is a market for really big knotty wood. Yeah, I think. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'll let all the people. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Paul. Um, Matthias. Matthias, where are you? Just asking you to unmute, Matthias. There yeah. you go. Thank you. So I'm unmuted, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Hugh. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, you mentioned in passing the, the English boxwood versus Mediterranean. So are you talking about different species or is it just different growing conditions? And if what is the difference and is it gradual as you move from south east towards northwest on the continent and where sort of does the the borderlines lie uh good it's a really good question because um no two trees are alike even on the same hillside no. um we're at the northern range of Buxus sempervirens, which is pan-European. Mm. So it is the same species. You know, the guys in Turkey selling boxwood, it is exactly the same species, but the climate is so different. Um, mm -hmm. And um, in France uh, or the Pyrenees or the Alps, um, you've usually got some altitude to contend with as well. Um, and perhaps some heavy snowfall, which might um, uh, inhibit which areas box can grow in, which we don't have here. Um, but in, in Ireland, Wales uh, and, and England, um, we've got a, had the higher rainfall and um, it, I, in my observation, it's, we've got wider grain. Um, so we've got more butter per, per, per ring. 
Um, yeah. and, and if you buy um, Mediterranean boxwood, you'll get slightly less, uh, you'll slightly tighter grain. And that's not necessarily a good thing when you're working it. No. So, but it, you, no two places are alike. And even on the same estate, you'll get two trees. Some trees are very tiny uh, and they're actually 200 years old. And the next tree is really fat and it's, it's 100. Uh, so some trees grow fast and others, um, they, they plod along for years and don't get very big. So, yeah, yeah. But so, yeah, so, so basically buying boxwood on spec is always uh, a gamble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the jobs I do, uh, occasionally I clear a workshop of um, um, a maker who's, um, who's left us. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I find often there's stashes in there that that, that maker may have um, had for 30 years from other makers. Um, and I, I have to do a whole forensic job. Um, yeah, exactly. but, but usually the, the executor, I'll tell them that that wood has gone to 30 different people. Um, and it hadn't actually shifted from that workshop for 30 years. So um, it's, it can be a positive experience like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not an easy, easy wood to read. Um, and a lot of the dry stuff is, is sometimes not very good, is the answer. Okay, thank you much. Thank you. Okay, I uh, believe uh, Rachel had a question, if she'd like to unmute and ask. Rachel, where are you? Okay, we'll move on to Chester then. Hey, Chester, where are you? He's probably trying to unmute himself. There you go. Is that right? Yep. Hey. Hey, that was terrific. What a great, uh, what a great talk. Um, Thank you. All throughout your whole thing, I kept thinking there's a hundred questions in between those several that were given to you. Um, and I doubt that you could handle all of those questions in one setting because uh, it's fascinating. Uh, I, I did find you in a, a concise encyclopedia of world timbers by Titmus, three variations of the Buxus and uh uh, and with varying differences. So there are some different species, but, but um, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I have to say, you and Jim, you know, the thing about addictions and addicts, they tend to be like uh, evangelists. They, they like other people to have the same problem. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and Jim has succeeded in, uh, in giving me that addiction because uh, the wood that you sent me was so fine and so really wonderful that I wound up doing a video about it. Um, and, and, and from that point on, learning so much about boxwood since then, because it's fascinating. And, and all I, I wanna thank you for that. And, and I just wanna show you, I don't know if I ever showed you uh, one of the first pieces that came out of, uh, out of the box from you was this little piece. And um, the thing uh, to relate to Jim, is that the reason that I didn't sell or give this away was because of this. And it's almost to me like a netsuke, a Japanese netsuke in its own form, because you see a lot of little Buddhas and things like that with these little, you know, little, uh, little cracks and some little, you know, I don't know how close I can get that you'd see it, it would focus, but. Um, uh, Chester, that looks like the, um, the, the, um, variations uh, uh, that you get at the pith of the middle of a big a big tree which is the remnants of the small tree which the big tree has grown around so yeah that's ah. the middle the middle of the tree which I would usually discard if I'm making musical instruments but um, a turner would find those details full of character so and that's and lovely this has no uh, no finish on it uh, per se like wax or anything it's just um, polished on the lathe and it has this waxiness to it. It's similar to ivory, similar to some bones, but um, there's, a, there's this, this waxiness to it and this um, very, um, it's not fragile at all, but it, but it has this daintiness to it or something. It's hard to describe, 
but um, but the, this is one of uh, just the first little scrap pieces that came out of the box, and I turned it, and I, I couldn't get very rid of cool. it. Very cool. That's really lovely. So anyway, I wanted to thank you, and uh, you're and, very uh, welcome. You're very welcome. I'll be, I'll Jessica, be getting more. Jester, can you have a guess at what this this turned object here might be used for? Well, it, it's it appears to me that it has to be worn, which means that it's either to keep something dry, um, uh, like I was thinking maybe for frankincense or myrrh or some gift to somebody that you, some treasured object. Not not quite, um, but um, let's keep let's keep on guessing. Okay. I want another guess on this one. Okay. There's, there's a big there's a big clue in the date. It's around 15, 1540 or fifteen thirty. Oh. Okay. Thanks, Chester. Thank you, Hugh. Rusty. Hey, Rusty. Are you are you unmuted? Oh, I'm, I think I'm unmuted now. Cool. Cool. Hey Hugh. Hey. How are you? Um, I have a comment and, and then a series of questions for me. So the comment is, I, I bought some boxes from you and uh, I have to say that the service was exceptional. You took the time to talk to someone who knows nothing about boxwood and educate me about it. And, and I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. Uh, You're I've very welcome. A little bit. Um, I think the most common use for the boxwood I got from you is I use it as a wear strip for um, spokeshaves that I make. And I just cut small pieces of end, um, end grain for it. Uh, the questions are, so when I first heard about you it was from another woodworker and you were described as this um, legendary figure with this legendary job. And, and I don't know how much of it is true. So I, I wonder if I can ask you about it. So, so here's what, I, what I've heard about you. You are the custodian of all of Boxwood in England and the only one who's allowed to cut boxwood in England. <laughs> you can, you can that. In fact, I don't actually want to know the truth because I like that story so much. And the other thing that I was told with a piece of boxwood that I was uh, given by that gentleman was that this was from a grove planted in 1625 and was, um, I think was harvested like 40 years ago and then air dried since then. So, um, Please correct me or just say that is all true and I'll go with that story. I wish I, I wish I had more. Um, I could uh, ups, upscale my business um, because I've I've been working on it 10 years now and I've learned an awful lot from the guys like you and a, um, a growing number of people. Um, but even in Britain, um, it's not easy to to. Um, to, to get into every estate and every ownership that's that's got box and um, Jim asked me a, a question about protection. Um, the vast majority of standing um, a box woodland is protected by law, and it's not easy to get in there felling, even felling um, selectively and sustainably, where you take out one percent of the crop, just a few straight ones and you leave the rest standing ecologically identical and even can regenerate, that is still a very, very difficult job. Even with the, the prospect of a, a plague of caterpillars, it's not an easy thing to do. So that's a great question, Rusty. Um, I wish I had more, um, uh, there's probably only me doing it. I think that's what, what um, uh, you may have heard in, from the past, there's, there's only me doing it. I, I do have two other jobs as, as well, but, um, uh, I've been doing box for 11 years now. So um, I would like to upscale in, in an answer to your question um, and maybe even work in other countries as well, um, more than I have done. So, um, and I absolutely love it. You know, I'm the, um, I'm like the, um, uh, who's is it, it breaking bad. You know, I'm the, I'm the guy who cooks all the meth and then Jim, Jim, uh, Jim's the one who-, who I was thinking more it. like Gandalf the Grey was missed. <laughs> so, and, and is that true that, that there are uh, all the groves are kind of uh, written? Rusty, you froze for a second. You've, you've frozen. Okay, I think we've lost Rusty. Oh, no. We'll, we'll come back to Rusty's question when he's back. 
Uh, cool. cool. The rate, I'm going to read out Rachel's uh, question due to mitigating circumstances. Um, apologies if this was covered before I came in. Is the boxwood used in woodworking mostly the same species as people use for garden hedges? I know boxwood is one of the most popular for topiary. It's exactly the same. Um, topiary and gardens and hedges and what have you in parterres is boxwood in captivity in the service of man and in the white wild um that's when it grows into a big tree um seven meters or whatever that you've seen on the slides it's exactly the same rachel it's just the same um uh, species um in fact even on the, in some big gardens you often get forgotten corners which were supposed to be topiary and hedges um and the trees go wild in the corners and that that's where it's really special because you've got both the wild tree and the the little um captivity tree together so the answer is yes okay and i stuck myself in here uh, rather than waiting till the end because i'm too impatient uh one of the um one of the boxwood nurseries that you manage is near the probably the most beautiful cricket ground in the country Worms. that's right yeah. so what's it like um managing a plantation right next to an area which does actually get a lot of traffic. Do you get a lot of people coming into the into the nursery, sort of uh, trespassing, I guess, or? How do you um, you're that? right. That's a really good question. Um, I've got, I've got uh, I'm, I'm, I manage woodland there as well as the plantations, and there are people walking through, and you do have to watch that they don't spread blight um, on their boots and what have you. So um, you have to keep people to the paths a little bit. Um, but it's just a great place to work because it's on top of the Chilterns and this opera as well. Um, there's some, sometimes music at the Garstington Opera you hear live whilst you're working. And um, the cricket matches are fantastic at Wormsley and I get uh, free tickets and I've got the gate codes to get in. So, uh, so I can take my family in. Um, it, it's a wonderful place to, to go and spend some time. And the, the Getty family, very, very supportive of so many things. Um, so it's it's a it's a very good place to work but um there are a lot of public rights away that go through the Getty's land and this always amazes americans um because they own a piece of land three miles by two miles quite near london and and yet everybody can walk through it and ride a horse through it and ride a bicycle through it and it's totally crisscrossed in rights of way um some of which go near my trees and and it, it's good because the public can see the trees too um without posing much of a hazard to them so uh, let's let's meet up at a cricket match there Shrenik. Lovely uh, it sounds like a brilliant day. Um, I think Josh has left the call so I'm gonna move on to Phil. Phil where are you? Any more guesses on my um, object? Uh, yeah well the guess is a uh, I think Chester guessed salt and I'd, I'd up his guess to pepper. We'll, we'll get to the guesses at the end. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Right. okay. Yeah. Thanks for talking so far. Um, on that object, you showed us a spalted object and moved on. I like spalted wood. Um, you also talked about the summer felling. Does that spalting just form in the same way as other, say, beech would form? It, it's, it's been on the ground, it's got a fungal infection? No, it's in the tree already. Um, it's living in the tree and uh, it's usually in the middle of the tree. Um, and it's very deep pigment in, the, I mean, this is a good example of it. Yeah. One side, one side is um, uh, an inky black. There's a clue as to what this might be. And the other side is, um, is absolutely ivory, ivory, uh, yeah. golden, yeah. golden yellow. So, and the, the end grain, that's typical. Um, sometimes musical instrument manufacturers like this, but generally they don't because the wood is ever so slightly weaker in the spot. Um, right. And, and it's not what is, is found with summer felling. Uh, summer felling produces a purpley gray stain on the whole of the timber. Um, mm. And, it, and it, this is already present in the wood. And um, normally I wouldn't but try to buy very much of this. Um, I don't mind buying some if it's in a stack already um, because the market isn't quite as big for spalt mm. as it is for super clean, super clean wood. Um, yeah. so. So it, so it grows when so it develops when it's standing, but is it still a fungal infection? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a yeah, and and there are other kinds of uh, funguses that live in. 
um, blight. We had a question on blight earlier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Blight stains the wood as well because the blight lives in the wood as well as in the branches of the tree. Okay, so, thanks. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, over to Chris. Uh, Chris Poole. I'm just trying hey, to Chris. find him. There we go. Hey. How are you? How are you? Excellent talk, but no surprises there. Um, I was just wondering, um, does this group think it might be able to help support um, efforts to safeguard the supply of English boxwood, given all the problems that we've got with it? I spend my days as, sorry, I should have said, I'm the chairman of the European Boxwood and Topiary Society. So um, I spend my day trying to make sure the caterpillar is not spreading and blight is not spreading. Given all these pro problems that are affecting the boxwood, what do you think the group could do to um, help make sure that we have a supply of wood available for turning and, and, and creating amazing instruments and tools? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, if I was able to upscale my business, I would do some preemptive felling on woodlands that were under threat. And then I'd have, um, you know, 10 or 20 year supply of top grade timber, you know, I wouldn't bother felling any B grade or C grade. Um, uh, bless you, Jim. I wouldn't. I wouldn't aim aim at some of the more knotty stuff initially. I would only make sure all the A grade came out, and then the that the, the market will never stand um, the clear felling at once because the market is small, but it's constant. So uh, what I would really like to do is to is to fell um, a, a significant amount and store it properly. Um, and make sure it's ventilated and dry it properly and then release it slowly into the market over um, a 20 year period, say, um, maybe my retirement, I don't know. <laughs> but um, but that, that's what I'd really like to do to, to ensure that we've got a sustainable source for it because in a few years time, the, the market, um, uh, you know, already in France and Germany, it's difficult to buy box and people are coming to me um, because they've lost their box. Um, and Chris, you've been to places in, on, in, in Europe where they've had the caterpillar. And can you tell us what, um, what the effect of the caterpillar has been in Europe? Uh, devastating, pretty much. Um, the largest box woodland uh, in Germany uh, was basically devoured by the, the caterpillar. Um, and it now only has a few um, box stands uh, regrowing because uh, when the box dies away uh deciduous trees grow in in its place and then it can't it can't then grow back again so it, it uh, entirely changes the uh ecology of the the, the woodlands and uh, they find a box finds it very difficult to, to to come back again so we've really got to hope that uh, we can control it in the uk uh i have to say doesn't seem much from our government to help in that sort of direction uh, but i do need to talk to you about a new thing that we applied at on the topiary side of things at Ham House yesterday, uh, we've tried a new thing, which is uh, mating disruption for the uh, moth. So uh, it only needs to be applied twice a year. So it's uh, easier than doing the spraying and it's about 95% effective. So cool. we'll talk Can about we... that. Yeah, um, Chris, the, the traps that we use for trapping moths, um, it's the, 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 they only trap the male moths and it's the female pheromone that we use for the traps. Um, so the it, it has a stronger scent than a, a female that, that wants to mate. Uh, so, but I think in big woodlands, all we're using the traps for is as indicators to see whether there's moths there. I think in a small garden, you can trap quite a few moths in a trap. But um, when you've got a whole hillside, the, there's not all the moths are going to go to the trap. So um, uh, Chris, Chris and I have been working together for about um, three or four years or, or, or so. Um, and Chris has been hugely helpful to with technical support um, against the in the war against the, the plague of moths. So um, thank you for that, Chris. That's very. Uh... The only other thing I was going to ask is how the um, so the Gettys are extremely up for this sort of thing. Do you find that the same with other um, you know selective felling and so on? Do you find that the same with other? Um, uh, owners of extreme no products. no of course not uh, it's very wide range of, of answers to that i mean for example the national trust who you'd think would be an organized body 
they've often got gardeners in charge who don't even know what the moths are um you know uh, uh, in a total state of ignorance and they don't know what to do with them and don't know how to do any forward planning and you'd think a national organization with a great many properties would be better organized um and then there's uh, aristocrats who own land who are just not interested in cooperating with anybody and i have to go and beat the door down i mean you've met one or two with me of people who are very difficult to work with and it's a delight to find um the american family living in britain who are very positively supporting everybody um and being professional and uh, philanthropic about it as well and yeah it's easy to say perhaps they can afford it but it's it's they they run their, their state very professionally too um productively and um, we do um agent uh like um selective felling there and we sell sell the timber um and um so there's a very wide range of um of, of people um that some uh, you've been with me to to hereditary landowners that have been on the same plot of land family for 300 years uh, it's all since henry the eighth and they're two terrible people to deal with so um it's not it's not easy is the answer I rely on some help from you I'm doing my bit as much as I can with the National Trust. I volunteer there uh, two days a week, so I'm trying to con convince them that uh, all boxwood is good. Can you can you manage a guess on, on my object, uh, Chris? I wondered whether it was uh, for holding a, a, a loved one's ashes, maybe? It could be. I, I would imagine Select. something a bit more liquid in, in, in there. So um, we're getting a bit closer. So it could be, could be an urn. Okay, um, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you. I'm going to move on to Richard Hughes. Richard. Hello, Richard. Come in, Richard. Yeah. Where are you? Yeah, here, yeah, here, here, here I am. Yeah, good, good, good evening. Um, Hi. Um, my que your question has, has already been partly answered. Uh, what what it, the starting point is in in Surrey? There's a famous um, beauty spot called Box Hill. And I understand that it was named because it had box trees growing on it. Now, Box Hill is owned by the National Trust. So my, my questions were, um, are there still box, Hill, box trees on Box Hill? And is the, is the National Trust proactive in, um, or helpful in, um, in maintaining or promoting the box trees? And you, you sort of answered that by saying, not really, but... <laughs> Not really is the answer. I, I must go back there because I live I live quite close to there. I was actually there on Saturday with my family, um, and um, that's where my son decided he was Britain's number two um, at talking about box. But I must go back there. And um, uh, it, the, the problem that Chris touched on before was that I have to go to each one of the individual National Trust properties um, and speak to the head gardener for each one in order to, to, to appraise them of what's going on. There's a lot of really good box at Box Hill. Um, it's not the biggest box woodland in, in Britain, but it's it's got some lovely steep chalk hillside covered in box. And um, I think they should be doing some selective management there in order to get them interested in the qualities of the timber and the value of it, not taking very many trees out. So that's a really good question. I, I should go there without my children and, and see the people there do a bit of arm twisting. Um, it's a great place to see box um you you at the hilltop you don't have to go very far um to if you live where, whereabouts do you live uh, well i live in in in, in surrey pearly so, so oh you're not very far at all yeah, so no you go there sometimes but uh, no. yeah uh, I, I, I haven't learned to recognize a box tree when i see it so that's that's a bit of education i need for myself um the banks of the river mole if you go a little bit west of the car park there, there's a great many with some yew trees at the top so you walk through the yew trees and then you're into the box beneath yeah. it. and there's a great many box there you know there's about 10 acres of, of box um on, on that really it's very steep wear some boots or something um yeah. it's a very good place to go and see box yeah okay thank you thank you thank you richard i think that was the last question for tonight so um, I'm going to go through the questions, uh, the answers, I mean, to uh, Hugh's question that came through. Uh, Matthias uh, thought it was incense. No. Nope. No. Is, is it uh, holy water? No. Nope. Uh, Matthias then thought it was a relic shrine. <laughs> uh, Julian Hatcliffe thought it was a pomander. 
That's close, but it would need holes in it if it was a pomando. Sorry. Um, uh, Chester thought it was to hold salt. Nope. Uh, Phil thought it was to hold pepper. Simon Troop thought it was uh, made for castrato so they could carry around severed parts in order to be <laughs> <laughs> I like that one yeah there's not much room in there but uh... <laughs> I, I, I had a thought it might be for India ink well then you're right Trenick this this is um, an officer's inkwell um, from the Mary Rose so every officer had to write down stuff on a warship um, in Tudor times and that's this is this is this would be filled with ink, and um, uh, he would get his quill out and write orders or um, whatever they write instructions to pass to another ship or whatever. Um, so every officer had one of these on the Mary Rose, and this was made for me by somebody who works in the Mary Rose Museum, producing facsimile copies of articles found on the Mary Rose musical instruments and um, uh, sundials. Uh, and combs, very common uh, comb, boxwood combs. So um, I really appreciated getting this. Uh, Peter Crossman made this for me. Um, Officer's Inkwell from the Mary Rose. But for Americans, it's a ship that sank um, in Portsmouth um, right in front of Henry Tudor in 1535 or something like that, 1537, uh, to his great embarrassment because it was his favorite warship and it went down with all hands and it was excavated in 1982. Um, it's now dug up and, um, and you can go and see it. And there's lots of boxwood objects there um, in the heyday of, uh, of boxwood. I think we've, so, had, um, brilliant. we've had the Mary Rose mentioned several times on boxwood over the last year. I think uh, Richard Hughes made a plane, uh, a copy of a plane from the Mary Rose. Am I right, Richard? Yes, I, I have made a copy of a plane from the, from the Mary Rose, but, but it was made of ash. It was, it was, it was a, big, uh, a big plane and it was made of ash, my Mary Rose replica. I have made some planes uh, out, out of boxwood, but they were much smaller. And, and not from the Mary Rose, but Roman planes or, or Saxon planes. Yeah. yeah. The, the carpenter's tool chest on the Mary Rose is stuffed full of rulers and, uh, and, and lots of different products made from because um, uh, some quite coarsely made rulers, just like shards of box with inches marked on them and stuff. Too. But um, yeah, uh, cool. Brilliant. I think this is around the time that we raise a glass uh, to Hugh and we say thank you. And also to Jim for interviewing Hugh. Um, cheers, Hugh. Thanks Where's for Jim gone? Where's Jim? Where's... Uh, You're I'm... welcome, everybody. You're very, very welcome. Uh, You're very awesome welcome. Thank you me. for listening. Cheers. Yeah, you. I'm still I'm still here, you Don't worry about that. I'm hovering in the background. Thanks, mate. That was brilliant. Um, so thank you, 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 everybody. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Cheers. 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 Cheers.